Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome to this evening's Arboricultural Association webinar. My name is John Parker, Chief Exec at the Association and your chair for this evening, chair of sorts. If you were here last week, you'll see that I haven't really got a terribly difficult job to do, but hey, I'm still the chair. Um, please say hello in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from. Make sure you select everyone when you do so. If you've got any questions, then please submit them in the Q&A panel. We'll work through as many as we can at the end. Although, as you may have seen from last week, I think we had about 45 questions last week, and I think we managed to work through about two of them. Um, but that's fine, because there's so much to talk about. So put your questions in. We'll make sure all of the questions and all of the chat get sent to our panellists after the webinar. They've been sent the questions from last week, so we might be touching on some of those areas again. And then what we've decided is we're going to pull all of the questions together, look out for any sort of common themes or anything, and then we're going to organise more webinars in the series, uh, probably, I guess, early in the new year now, to maybe get into some of the detail and the nitty gritty about some of the stuff that you're most interested in. So if you've got any particular requests that you'd like our panel to cover or additional people to our panel, then do let us know in the chat. So this evening is part two of Ted Green, Lynn Body and Friends talking a load of rot. Last week was really great. This week promises to be more of the same. So we're very pleased about that. And of course, a happy National Tree Week to all of you. Um, next week, we're going to be trying something a little bit different, which is either going to be brilliant or is going to go horribly wrong. Uh, it's our Cornwall branch's annual general meeting in Truro. I'm going to be heading down there to meet up with some of our lovely members. And the plan is we're going to be broadcasting our Wednesday webinar live from Truro as we take a closer look at our boriculture in Cornwall. Um, we don't have anything that I describe as a proper plan yet, but hey, we've done, we pulled stuff together in less time than we've got now. So please join us live in Cornwall next week. Uh, there'll be a registration link somewhere in the chat. I'll put one in later if it's not there for our magical mystery tour of Cornwall this time next week. But now, first of all, it is my great pleasure to hand over not to Ted, who said, forget about me, let's go straight to Lynn. So we will do that, Ted. We're going to skip straight over you. And we're going to go to Lynn Body for the second part of Lynn's presentation. And then we're all going to have a good chat about it afterwards. So Lynn, over to you. Well, thank you very much, John. And thank you for inviting me back. So... <laughs> Last week, I got the impression from some of the questions at any rate that, that a lot of people thought that decay was a bad thing. But I'd like to remind you that trees and fungi have evolved hand in hand over millions and millions of years. Decomposition is essential to their continuing growth and it's also essential to biodiversity and to overall ecosystem functioning. Now, trees represent a long-lived, movable feast. And of course, some tree trees live for a very long time. Um, oaks, for example, 900 or more years if things go well. And sometimes people say that um, oak trees grow up for 300 years, live in maturity for 300 years, and then decline gracefully for 300 years. Now, in, in those first few hundred years, very little decay occurs, I guess, usually. In, in full or late maturity, a stage we might call veterans, we start to see a lot more decay. So, for example, in the uh, central tissues, the heartwood, uh, decay begins to occur. Uh, limbs, large ones, small ones, even small twigs, often are shaded out and become dysfunctional in conduction of water, and they rot as a result of Basidiomycete and Xylariaceous Ascomycete fungi. And it's a process of, of natural pruning, which I guess um, removes weight from the tree and uh, lets the branches fall to the floor because they become weakened to decompose and, and to add nutrients to the soil to be taken up again by the tree. And then we go later into early ancient stages and the heartwood becomes more decayed. And we often tend to see this stag-headed condition where the crown has started to retrench. Um, these branches have begun to decay and often um, heartwood is still left there in the canopy, sticking out for a very long time. The sapwood has decayed and recycled, but we have this stag-headed appearance. And of course, we move on to, to later stages, further crown retrenchment, more decay in the heartwood. And then finally, I guess that uh, decay of the trunk, trunks is the dominant feature 
and also decay of woody roots. Now, today I'm going to take three aspects of decay that I'd like to talk about, sort of three sort of case studies. Uh, decay of sapwood in the standing tree, and particularly I want to concentrate on natural establishment from latent propagules. Then secondly, um, I will talk a little bit about decay in the vicinity of wounds. And then finally, to think a bit about decay at the centre of trees, in other words, heart rot. So let's start then with natural establishment from latent propagules. Uh, and interestingly, I think that last week Caroline mentioned uh, the, the first conference that we met at, which was in 1993. And I think that this was one of the topics that I talked about then. And some of the, the, the information then will be familiar to some of you. Uh, but other stuff is more recent. So I, I'd like to, to refresh your memories if you've heard this before. So in ooh, the early 1980s, we began to look at attached branches in the canopy of trees. And fortuitously, it was oak. And I say fortuitously because the decay communities in oak are, are relatively rather simpler than in other tree species, such as beech. Now, let me remind you, that's a long time ago. We didn't have these modern molecular sequencing techniques that we have now. Um, almost all of the work that had ever been done on fungal ecology before had been based just on fruit bodies. And I think we were at a stage where people really thought still that trees were sterile inside. So we had a backdrop of, of not really knowing anything much at all, and nothing had been done on branches. So our approach was to chop down branches which had signs of decay, such as fruit bodies like Volaminia comedens, you can see here, and Pinyophora quis sign that you can see there. And then we chopped these branches transversely into sections so here's an example of a section from um, this tree somewhere in this vicinity, I think. You can see the interaction zone lines here. Those are, are, are zones of interaction between different species of fungi and different individuals of the same species. We touched on that briefly last year. You can also see these other features here. This is premature heartwood, which we described as heartwood wings at the time. This wood here, although it looks in a pretty poor state in this photo, actually was still functional at the time of felling or, or just before felling at any rate. Now, what we did then was to, to record all the different regions, the interaction zone lines, the, um, the heartwood wings, the location of functional sapwood. We took chips of wood from all these different regions put it onto plates of agar jelly to see what fungi grew out. Now, at the time, people said, well, you won't be able to do much with that because who knows what the fungus is. People tended to think that fungi were sort of cotton woolly um, masses that more or less looked look the same, but not so. We made isolations from fruit bodies and got the mycelia to grow. And we found that we could easily dis discriminate between the 12 or so main species we found in oak. So we could do this. So we knew we could find out what species were in each of these different regions, and they're indicated here, VC, Volumina comedians, PQ, Pinophora, Quasina. Incidentally, an, another aid that we had was with some of our sections, we sprayed them with water and put them in plastic bags, and you can see that uh, mycelium grows out. Anyway, we can map where the fungi are. Another trick that we used was that with Basidiomycete fungi, if you pair them together, in other words, on, on agar culture, you put, put two little inocula with the fungus growing in. If they grow towards each other and they're the same species, if they're the same individual, the hyphae meet. So if, if my fingers were representing this, my fingers would meet, the hyphae meet, they fuse, they recognize their self and they remain as one. And you know you've got a single individual. On the other hand, Again, if we're talking about the same species of fungus, if they grow together and meet and fuse and then reject each other, you know that they're different individuals. Fungi are individuals like you and I, but they recognize themselves in a different way. So based on this, we could work out where the same and different individuals were. So if we look at this VC1, Volaminia comedens 1, it extends up the tree to about here. There's the scale bar, so I'm guessing this is five or six meters. You can see that there was a VC2, Volminica medians in individual two, which also extended a long way. 
And then there are six individuals of Pinophora quasina. And then at the time we thought, gosh, this is, these are long individual decay columns of, of individual fungi. Um, it was a bit hard to think that they do, did this in rather a short time because we suspected that they'd done this in probably less than one growing season. We wondered how, how this would happen. And we, we thought, well, maybe there are fungi already present there within the functional sapwood. Now, nowadays, people would say, yeah, that'll be it. Everybody knows about endophytes. They didn't know about endophytes then, well, not very many people. So that was our hypothesis. And we set about testing this hypothesis. We actually tested it in beach. And we chopped down branches, which looked to us to be perfectly healthy and functional. And we chopped um, the, the branches into lengths of, I don't know, I can't remember now, perhaps about 20 centimeters, something like that. You can see them illustrated here. Then we covered the ends. For some of them, we'd slab, put slabs of agar on to keep them wet. Other ones, we just cut different sized holes in to let water evaporate. And so they dry down at different rates that the bigger the surface area exposed, the more rapidly they dry down. Other ones, we removed the bark um, so that if fungi did appear, one couldn't argue that they'd come in from the bark. And then this picture here summarizes what we found. So this is an increased rate of drying. So here, this was water saturated. Those sections um, didn't dry at all. And these dried increasingly faster. In all of them, except the water saturated wood, we found fungi developing. In the ones which dried very rapidly though, the fungi stopped because it got too dry too quick, but in the Goldilocks conditions, um, decay developed. And you can recognize this, I'm sure if you've seen beech branches, this is typical of, of things like Biscognioxin numularia and Hypoxylon frangiformi. And there perhaps is one of these little latent pockets beginning to develop. And eventually people thought, yes, this is what's happening. These fungi are latently present in functional sapwood. And then a while later, we, we started to look, this was work that I did with um, David Lonsdale and Stephen Hendry. Uh, we, we, we found strip cankers, strip cankers on beech trees. You can see one of Biscognioxia numularia. And here we have Eutipus spinosa spiraling up for very many meters around the trunk of beech trees. And these developed um, in specific years. And, and you'll recognize, I expect, if you, if you live in Britain and you're old enough, that these were the years following drought. So it turns out again that the fungi which cause these strip cankers are again latently present. And um, they emerged in drought probably because the, uh, the column of xylem couldn't get enough water perhaps the roots were damaged or, or decayed or perhaps colonized by a, a pathogen such as armillaria, or maybe the canopy was damaged and was no longer intact and did not suck water up. So again, these are, this is evidence of, of latently present fungi. Then in more recent times, um, in the, in the uh, well, a little before 2010, when molecular tools became on the scene, we were managed to, to develop what are called specific PCR primers. And these can detect for different, in different species of fungi. And we had 11 species of fungi. Doesn't matter what they are, the abbreviations are along the top here. And we tested a range of tree species, about 11 tree species indicated there to see whether any of these fungi, which we know are latently present, whether they actually were present in these different tree species. And we found that in fact, lots of them were present in lots of tree species. So there's Daldinia in lots of tree species, Sterium gaussopartum in quite a few tree species, Sterium rugosum in lots of tree species and so on. So it turns out that there are in fact, um, decay fungi latently present in lots of tree species, and actually many of the same species are present in lots of tree species, which came as a little bit of a surprise. Now, more recently still, there are uh, more powerful molecular tools available, which can actually uh, tell you the presence of lots of different species without just looking for the single ones individually. It can tell you lots of things. This is called high throughput molecular sequencing or next generation sequencing. And uh, so we sampled well, actually quite a lot of tree species, but we've only analyzed the beech tree 
trees so far. We, we've analysed mostly from about 1.3 metres um, above the ground, so at breast height, but also, as you can see, uh, we've analysed from different locations up a tree, and we were lucky enough to have Ed Pine, um, who is both an arborist and uh, a mycologist, so that was good. And we found um, in beech a whole host listed here of white rot species, three brown rot species, a lot of soft rotters, and indeed very many other species too, which don't really have a, a role in wood decay as far as we know. So effectively, we now know that there's sort of a soup, in inverted commas, of fungi sat in functional xylem waiting for the opportunity to develop as decay columns. And of course, most of those latent propagules will never get that opportunity. Now, of that soup, which species develop depends on the environment. So we know about the early colonizers of, of, of quite a few angiosperm tree species. And we often tend to get um, groups of fungi on different trees. So for example, um, Birch often has Fomis fermentarius and Fomitopsis betulinus. Oak has, as we've already said, Volaminia comedens and Pinophora quercina, but also Felinus ferius, Phoebia rufa, and Sterum gasopartum are primary colonizers. Um, and beech has uh, several Ascomycetes and a few Basidiomycetes too. So you can see they've got different communities of early colonizers. And and what we actually found out then by doing experiments, by doing that same sort of incubation experiment as I described before, we changed the drying rate, we changed the temperature and the gaseous regime, and we found that different environmental conditions selects for different species from that sort of soup of latent propagules. And they are the first decayers in the canopy, but Although many of them are capable of completely decomposing the sapwood, they don't very often get the chance to do that because more combative, better fighting fungi come in, things like Trometes vesicolor, Phlebia radiator, Sterum hirsutum, Jocandera, Arduster, and they will replace them and, and carry on with the job. There are also other fungi which are not very good fighters, such as Schizopora paradoxa. I think that may have changed its name now. This isn't a very good fighter, but it has another characteristic. It produces what are called chlamydospores. These are thick-walled spores, resistant survival spores. And as we know, conditions in the canopy can get very dry. And under those conditions, mycelium, if there's not enough water, will die. But these thick walled chlamydospores can survive. So when they get wet again, um, they will germinate and, and off the fungus go. So that's how this fungus takes on that role in the canopy. Most decay or complete decay does not occur in the canopy. Branches become weakened, they fall to the floor and complete decay continues on the floor. That's a story for another time. So that's the first story that I wanted to tell you. And, and we found this out in the 1980s and, and have progressed the story since. But I, I want to take you back a little bit in time to, to the 1970s when people had started really thinking about wounds and in particular Alex Shigo and, and a lot of colleagues in North America and to some extent elsewhere started thinking about wounds. So they could be big wounds on trunks which maybe were made by um, large animals or by forestry operations as seen also here, or they could be smaller wounds. And in this particular case here, this wound is a wound that I made and then put in uh, a block of wood colonized by a fungus, a, a dowel of wood. So that's about um, a centimeter in diameter. And the classic thing with which I'm sure you are all familiar is that from a wound, um, decay is often what has been termed compartmentalized though. I'm not necessarily a fan of that terminology. And you can see that here. In other words, uh, the extent of decay is restricted to, to relatively close to the wound. In, in, in this case here, you can see that it's extended a little bit further, but that's because I also did uh, some girdling too. Now, before I go on to say a little bit more about this, um, I want to step back and think about defense passive defense and active defense. Now, this is Chepstow Castle near where I live, and it was built in, in 1067, just after 
the Norman conquest of Britain. Um, and in, in Wales, there are probably more castles per unit area of land than, than anywhere else in the world. Uh, so I've read at some point. Uh, and this castle, at the time of it, it, it's being built, indeed for, for um, probably about 500 years, nobody ever, no, no invaders ever managed to get into it. And you can see why it's got high walls. And, and at the time, there would have been no trees, no, no town here or anything else that they could see for far and wide. There's this huge cliff extending down into the River Wye. There's the River Wye, which flows very rapidly at a rate of something like seven knots. And it attaches to the River Seven, which is a, has a tidal rise and fall, uh, about 40 feet, so the second highest in the world. Um, so it's got amazing passive defences with, without soldiers to defend it. It defends well um, if the drawbridge and the, well, there's no drawbridge, if the portcullis and the gate is shut. OK, so that's passive defence. Nobody's doing anything. Those features defend that castle. If you put people on the walls with their bows and arrows and their boiling oil to throw over the top if invaders come, then that is active defence. Active defence can only be performed um, by living things. Passive defence can be performed by inanimate, dead materials. So I want to move on to thinking very, very briefly about the codic concept, which was brought in by Shigo in response to his observations of wounds. And Shigo um, said that around wounds, the tree puts down walls called walls one, two, three, and four. Um, and they are weakest as wall one and strongest as wall four. Now I have to say, I really don't like this terminology. They are not walls. Um, I rather prefer the terminology of Shane who brought in the idea uh, of a barrier zone, which is equivalent to Shigo's wall four and reaction zone, which is equivalent to walls one, two and three, because actually one, two and three are um, the, same, the same thing, but in, in different uh, planes within the wood. Now, uh, as I say, Shigo suggested that wall one was the weakest, but I would like to suggest to you that some of the patterns we see are simply due to the anatomy of the tree and indeed probably to, uh, to the physiology or, the, or at least the presence of water. So one reason why we get ex extended columns in this direction rather than tangentially or radially is that there are large vessels in that direction. These are, these are those dead cells which are hollow but which conducted water before they were damaged from the roots to the shoots. And here you can see one such vessel in oak, uh, and here uh, are hyphae in there. Now, these vessels can be plugged actively. They are dead, but attached to, to each one, there is a living cell. Those living cells can respond if these uh, the vessels in this direction become damaged, because a tree cannot afford to have its plumbing system have air bubbles in it. And so the, um, there are little protrusions from the living cells into this xylem element, which is, which is dead empty cell. These are called tyloses, and you can see them here in, in tangential section and here in longitudinal section. They often become covered with gums and tyloses. So they are what is stopping um, air getting into the water conducting system of the tree in, in a longitudinal direction. Now, one of the things which makes spread of fun fungi, if it's a fell tree, a standing tree or whatever, much slower in a radial and tangential direction is that the fungi have to grow through woody cell walls, so that takes longer, but also in the standing tree, if the remaining xylem around here is functional, it's full with water, and that is inimical to the growth of fungi, so they can't actually get into there on the whole. Now, in saying that, there are living cells in, xyle, in, in, in parench, as I said, attached to the, to the xylem ves vessels, also in ray parenchyma, but in, in various 
um, spots around it attached to the, 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 uh, the xylem vessels. These can respond because they're living. Dead cells can't respond, but the living ones can. And so they, they can uh, make compounds, which um, probably are sealants to protect the, um, the functionality of the rest of the xylem. And in so doing, coincidentally stop the hyphae, the fungal hyphae from getting there because they're maintaining the water content in the rest of the wood. And they may contain compounds slightly inhibitory to fungi, but fungi are really quite remarkable. These wood decay fungi can rot anything. And if you cut blocks out with, with these, um, the, the, these reaction zones in, uh, and Francis Schwarz has done this, fungi can grow through them. You need one hypha to penetrate through and it's away. And then the, the barrier zone. Now the barrier zone, this is the region which was um, before wounding, this, this was effectively almost the outside of the tree. So the tissues beyond have grown since wounding. They've grown as a re result of cambial activity. And the, ba the barrier zone does contain different cells. Uh, and again, um, it's, a, it's a waterproof barrier to stop the new tissues becoming aerated. This has to be the prime reason uh, for um, these, what might be called defense reactions from the living cells to maintain uh, the water conducting system of the tree and in so doing um, also keeps the, keeps fungi out by coincidence. Um, also with response, with, with regard to wounding, of course, the, these are features that we've often, we often see. We know that um, when, when there's uh, wounding damage that you get wound wood form. Sometimes we call it callus. I think callus isn't the right word. Callus just means a, a, um, a little mass of undifferentiated tissue, which you get to start with. And then the, uh, the cambium actually produces, as usual, xylem on the inside of it and phloem on the outside. So this is the wound wood. And of course, in this xylem, which is no longer functional, which has become aerated because uh, the vessels have been broken and water is no longer being sent there um it's drying down so decay can occur and decay does occur one other point before i, I move on and that is that uh in the past it was suggested that non-decay organisms are essential uh, on wounds for the before decay fungi um basidiomyces etc can establish now that is absolute load of nonsense um because to start with, we know that some basidiomyces, such as Sterum sanguinolentum and Chondrosterum purpureum, that is the way they get into trees. We know that other basidiomyces can establish by direct inoculation. There you are, I inoculated one there. Here's one of our students um, inoculating for conservation there. Now, actually, what's happened is that. The fungi which land on a wound, which is then dis dysfunctional tissue, are those which produce spores most prolifically in the air. Whatever gets there first can start to establish first. And it happens that more often than not, these are non-decay fungi. Um, but things latently present can then begin to establish from inside or indeed eventually wood decay basidiomyces will arrive. So that's why you see this pattern, not because they these non-decay fungi have to be there. They don't. Okay, then moving on to the third uh, topic and going back in time as far as interest in decay in trees is concerned. So for, for the branches, we were in the 1980s um, for the, and beyond. And for the wounds, we we're in the 1970s. And now people, I, I want to think about decay in the center of the trees. Heart, people began to think about this in the 1800s, foresters in Germany wanted to know why the centers of their trees were rotten because they couldn't sell them um, for timber. And of course, at that stage, people didn't even know that it was fungi. They wanted it to be found out what it was and to stop it. And of course, this, this couldn't occur. And indeed, um, little bits of research were done here and there, um, but it sort of dwindled out in, oh, I don't know, 1950s or 1960s perhaps, except for the work on those fungi 
um, which could cause, which are pathogens, um, at least a part of their lives, a little bit of their lives, and cause butt rot from the base, the important ones commercially, like our malaria and heterobasidium. Anyway, uh, I suppose in the last seven or eight years, we've been lucky enough to start to work on this. And heart rot is associated with large girth trees very often, but actually that's not really strictly true in, in trees such as oak, that they, they often have a large girth, but that's associated with large uh, age, old age. It's age that's important as far as heart rot's concerned. This elder uh, trunk isn't, isn't very large, but it's old. Likewise, this photo of a bonsai tree that Ted took, this cannot be considered as a big tree, but it's an old tree and it has heart rot. So uh, heart rot tends to happen when trees are older, as I said right at the beginning. And uh, I, I mostly put in this picture, which is one of my favourites, as, as Ted will tell you. This is a tree that um, Ted found for us and effectively reconstructed on the floor this, this fell tree, beech tree, um, which had a decaying heart. And um, we analysed this tree in the same way as, as I've already described the branches, really. We cut slices out and made isolations from all sorts of different regions. I'm not going to show you what we found in that tree. I'll give you a, a couple of other examples to make a change and to, to tell some other messages. Now, this, this is a beech tree. Um, there was no external indication of heart rot at all. You can see at the base, it was very well rotted. It was hollow. Now the fungus we found, the dominant fungus, which went all the way up uh, for 15 meters or so, as far as we analyzed, the fungus was Foliota sclerosa. Now that fungus is not considered in the literature to be a heart rotter of, of beech trees at all. And you can get a clue why it produces these fleshy fungi that you can see here. And they probably just hadn't really been noticed. So you can't believe everything you see about fruit bodies, really. They don't tell you the whole story. So that was a surprise. Then there was another surprise here in the base of, of this tree. We couldn't really see any interaction zone lines, probably because it was relatively early stages of decay. We found Utipa spinosa. That's one of those fungi which cause strip canker. So that was no surprise. But then we found Hyphaloma fasciculari, the sulfur tuft fungus, which we so often see on stumps. Now, I would always thought of that as a late stage decay. It's a great fighter. It comes in and replaces most other things that are there. Really brilliant fighter. But here it was in the center of this tree at very early stages of decay. And indeed, why not? It's, it travels through, through the forest floor as mycelial cords, as well as it can arrive um, as spores. So you can imagine it's relatively easy to get in there. Perhaps there was a decay in root somewhere and up it came. But again, that was a surprise to us. And the surprise is carried on. We analyzed about 19 trees in that way, uh, but 19 trees isn't enough to tell the story. And so we went on and called, uh, I've forgotten now, 60 something trees um, with uh, an increment borer that you'd use to, 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 to count the growth rings. So here's is a core that we got out and you can see it's decayed in, in certain places along, along here. We took chips out, put on, a, on agar culture to see what fungi grew out and also extracted DNA straight from this wood to build up the picture of what's going on. So with our three methods, the core in method, the section in method, and with the method, with the, with the information um, from fruit bodies uh, given in the literature, uh, we looked to see what the story was. So we found all of these fungi, okay? So the, the blobs here are the fruit bodies. All of those that I have circled in red are not things that are really thought by most people to be heart rotters because most of the story was built up previously based on fruit bodies. So the message is you really can't necessarily read too much into the presence or the absence of fruit bodies at all. So <laughs> caution is the watchword there. We also um, found in the literature two fungi 
in, in the European literature, Fomi Fomenterius and Fomi Topsis Panicula, which are very common as heart rot as a beach, yet we didn't find this. Now, we do get Fomi Fomenterius quite commonly in Britain, particularly on birch. Fomi Topsis Panicula, on the other hand, isn't common. I've seen it a couple of times in Epin, but it isn't common. And yet on continental Europe, it really is. You know, what's going on? Why don't we have those? Are they, are they not really here in any great numbers or what? We don't know. And I'd just like to say a little bit before I finish about oak. We've started looking at oak as well. Now, oak seems to be rather different. This is a, a section through an oak trunk. And we haven't been able to analyze many trees. One, because we haven't been able to get many because not many are taken down. But secondly, it, it is very, very time consuming. And we found um, some decay fungi in various places. No sign you'll notice of interaction zone lines. Maybe that's because this is at early stages of decay. Maybe this doesn't happen in, in oak. Maybe it doesn't happen in brown rotted wood. We don't yet know. But I'll give you a bit of a taste of what, what we found out. We've actually analysed, or, or in the midst of analysing, 100 cores, uh, well, cores from 100 trees, I suppose I should say. And here um, are eight cores, uh, just to show you what we found in, in eight, eight of them. So this is the outside of the tree. Uh, this is the sapwood. This record is more or less the heartwood boundary, but probably heartwood extends a little bit into sapwoods in places, if not entirely. Uh, circular. And this represents the fungus found to walk, going along one of these cores that we've had. So this is the centre of the tree here. Red colour is Fistulina hepatica, the beef steak fungus. Um, the yellow is Latiporus sulfureus, chicken of the woods. Grey is Griffula frondosa, and the brown is, is just some other Basidiomycete. And you can see in these cores it was dominated by Fistulina. And usually when we had Latiporus, or griffula, it was towards the center of the tree. Incidentally, we saw this fungus fruiting in, in this particular tree, but we did not uh, detect it actually in the heart rot itself. Now, I just put data here, because this is all that we've got summarized at the moment for 29 of the trees from four different sites. And you can see that overall 52% of trees have fistulina, 27 later porous, and 72% uh, percent had wood decay species of one sort or another. Um, sometimes fistulina was on its own, sometimes later porous on its own, sometimes both, and then sometimes other species, or very often no decay species. And that's because those trees were probably not old enough, not that we just didn't detect them. So to summarize that, now, fruit body observations on oak actually do reflect what we found in cause, in that we would guess from fruit body records that fistulina and later porous would be the most common things, and they certainly seem to be. Fistulina is by far the most dominant species, as you saw. Um, later porous commonly occurs towards the center, especially in those trees where fistulina has already been. Maybe fistulina creates conditions more suitable for later porous. And in that later porous, we often find lots of ascomycetes too. And fistulina and later porous were the only basidiomycetes that we found in the center of trees growing on their own. So that's the story so far. Now, usually when I give a talk about heart rot, I say the importance of heart rot at the beginning, but I'm putting it near the end of this talk because I really want to impress upon you the importance of decomposition, why heart rot is important to trees and to the environment, why it shouldn't in most natural circumstances be thought of as a bad thing. I know as arborists, you have to think about safety and that, that's a, a different consideration, but from an ecological perspective, it's important for nutrient cycling. This is the center of a hollow in beech tree. Look at this. This, this, this is soil. If ever there was soil, this is soil. It's full with roots. These roots are from this tree. They're adventitious roots which have grown down and presumably are taking the nutrients back that have been released by those decomposer fungi. There are some more examples of, of roots going into heart rot here as well. Heart rot habitat is important for fungi, obviously, but that includes threatened species such as Buglossa, Horus quercinus, the world's stronghold for this is Windsor Great Park. 
um, Herisium species, Herisium coralloides and Erinaceus, which in much of Europe is threatened, not all of Europe, uh, and also in other parts of the world, it's they're not necessarily so threatened, such as in North America, but they certainly are here. So it's important for them. It's important habitat for, for vertebrates. Um, probably worldwide, something like 1,500 species of birds and mammals uh, and other vertebrates are dependent on this habitat. There's the red percaded woodpecker in North America. Uh, it's also important for invertebrate habitat. In the UK alone, something like 1,700 species are dependent on this type of rotting wood. And that includes about 6% of, of the UK species, and including 15% of the rarest, such as the violet click beetle, the meniscus violaceus, which you might find in a, in a hollow in trees such as this here. So decay is really important. And in fact, we have we have problems with not having enough of these old trees for what we will we and our biodiversity need for the future. Um, we're pretty well off, I guess, in Britain compared to, to other European countries, and we, we have quite a lot of large old heart, heart rot habitat here. Um, and we know that lots of trees are being replanted, are being planted in these huge planting programs, but we don't have those trees in the middle age categories to come up and fill the ancient, the veteran and ancient category. And so one of the things we're trying to do is um, to veteranize, but in a little different way, somewhat different way to, to what other people have tried. Some other people have tried cut, cut, making wounds and um, I don't know, burning the base, ripping limbs off, etc., and, and cutting cutting holes for, for to, to simulate, I don't know, holes that you get in the tree for bats and birds and what have you. And, and that's all well and good, but we wanted to be a bit more targeted and we wanted to put in uh, the appropriate fungi to speed the process on even more. So you can see here, cutting out a, a hole, a sort of a roughly square shaped hole in which we subsequently put a block of wood which has is colonized by an appropriate heart rot fungus and packed it in with colonized sawdust so that's a veteran veteranization inoculation we also did reintroduction inoculations which wasn't just to make heart rot but was to introduce threatened species such as herisium erinaceus and for this we inoculated dowels colonized by the fungus or sometimes um, just sawdust colonized by the fungus. And we're now at the monitoring stage so um, we've recorded fruit bodies on quite a few of these. They've only been going for two or three years now, um, taking samples uh, from above and below to see whether the fungus is established because really this is a very long-term program. This is going to be going on and when I'm no longer here, it's in 30 or more years that we we'll really know whether we've been successful. So we can uh, extract sawdust and culture it, like you can could see here, or sample from the DNA directly. And also, um, we are hoping that we will be able to, if we can get enough help from arborists, uh, to use tomography of one sort or another to try and see whether hollowing or decay of any sort is, is establishing beyond the inoculum. So is it a useful tool? Is, is it a useful com conservation tool? An optimistic yes. Um, we know already that decay has initiated in some of our inoculated trees because samples have shown this, um, but we've got much more sampling still to do. So on that note, I'd like to thank you all for listening, to thank everyone over the years who has helped and the funders of this work and also thanks for those who've kindly supplied photographs. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Lynn. Brilliant stuff as ever. We've got lots going on in the chat. We've got lots of questions. Actually, we haven't got that many questions. We've got half a dozen questions, but that's we're possibly all questioned out from last time. They'll come. Um, I've got a feeling that some of our panelists might have some questions or comments or thoughts. Ted, you've been incredibly quiet. Well, I think I owe Lynn a meal. I, I think she's really explained to people in the tree world the, the co-evolutionary relationship between trees and fungi, and that rot is not 
rot. Rot is essential. Rot is so much part of the aging process and everything. And uh, I mean, as you know, I've in the past I've used Ripolis and I've called it seeing is believing because in many respects, what I was trying to do was say, if you don't see Ripolis or some of these other fungi are the reason for the rot, then can you manage the tree? Because you are the doctors, you are the GPs of the tree world. And this is so they should see these 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 organisms which are associated with parts of the tree which they are decaying down as let's look at it, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? Is it because it's not necessarily seen as bad news? Thanks, Lynn. Uh, what, what we should have said was, of course, is that uh, in the midsummer next year, we hope to hold uh, a Picos Day at Windsor on, on those beech trees of Lynn's. There's 90 of them, or 100, I think. And anybody that's got a Picos that wants to come along for a day can meet Lynn and meet um, John Hartill and Mike and Pete, Mike Ellison, he's there, and talk about the interpretation of what they're actually finding. So if you like, watch John Parker's uh, diary or calendar, whatever you want to call it. So Lynn, I owe you a meal. Oh, well, thank you very much. I think Jill's got a question or comment. Well, I'm picking up, um, Lynn, on one of the questions that's coming on the Q&A from Rebecca Alvarez Segoya. Um, and I think this is one of the key points that uh, you made, but may not have been fully understood, that we have two types of wood in trees. One is the living wood and one is the dead wood. Um, and I think... Um, what we need to do is say we don't really want uh, I'm going to be it's going to be a bit dangerous here we don't want decay and rot in the sapwood we want our sapwood to be as functioning as we possibly can if we want our trees to go on into a lot you know very old age you know obviously so, some elements of the sapwood uh, may parts of the sapwood may not be functioning and therefore you know, the tree can cope with that. But on the whole, we want our sapwood to be as healthy mm. as possible. And because it's on the outside, the rings are increasing each year and the tree can continue to grow and live and expand and and be very old. By comparison with the heartwood, or we might also have in you know, certain types of tree, ripe wood. And that's a very different issue. So it's all to do with uh, what is the the wood and of course the sapwood's full of moisture as you said last week and because it's full of moisture that means there's very low oxygen and if there are if there is uh, a, a, any uh, capacity for other uh, chem, um, uh, uh, substances to be there carbon dioxide for example um, then they're, they're high, in high proportions by comparison to the oxygen so that the fungi aren't working. So I think there is a difficulty because you showed a branch which is all sapwood. And so the, there wasn't the differentiation there of sapwood and heartwood. So people can start to think, oh, well, we're dealing with a whole tree again, rather than dealing with uh, part, you know, we, a branch can be all sapwood, whereas in the trunk, generally speaking, after about 30 years or so, give or take, you know, you're actually starting to put, you know, have heartwood and that's changing over as the tree grows out, that heartwood is changing over time. And uh, as the taproot uh, comes away or if there are wounds or whatever, um, Air can get into the into the center of the tree, and that can aerate, uh, put air into the system, and then of course decay can be triggered. And depending on how damaging, how much damage has occurred, perhaps 
uh, the rate of decay can be very relatively fast. And that might be an issue with a tree, but generally speaking, uh, they may be able to cope with quite a bit of that. Okay, yeah. So let me perhaps extend on that a bit more, just to and then Caroline. Can I, Lynn, can I cut in very quickly, just because, Jill, sorry, the audience can't see the questions. So I'll just, the question from Rebecca that Jill was referencing there was, how can heart rot trees live if they have decay in the centre of them? How can they survive so many years? So sorry right. to cut in, but that was okay. a question that prompted Thank you, John. I didn't realise that. No, no, no. Yeah, th thanks very much. Okay, yeah, so to just... One from yeah. Neville. Neville's got a sale. Say, so got his hand up. Yeah. Hello. Okay. So there's Ka there's Carolyn, Caroline, and Neville next, but perhaps I could just expand upon that slightly. So yes. hi, uh, Neville. So as as Jill said, um, the outer sapwood is functional in conduction of water in the trunk from the roots to the shoots. In the central regions, that the tissues are no longer con conducting water, so they become aerated. They're not. They're not. You. They're not used for that crucial job of of, of 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 shifting water about. They're aerated so fungi can establish in them. What I should say to avoid any confusion, perhaps uh, that other people that people might have got, is that I was talking when I talked about um, dead and living cells. I should say that the sapwood, or I should say again that the sapwood has dead and living cells in it. Those cells which conduct water are actually dead. They are hollow. They are tubes like drain pipes. So even in, in functional sapwood, you've got these dead tubes, the important ones for shooting water up and down, but they have living cells attached to them that can respond. So this was in connection with the, 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 what I was telling you about wounding. Um, also the um, the rays, the ray parenchyma, they're living cells and can do responsive things. So that's it. That's in the trunk. Jill's absolutely right. Of course, in branches, very often, um, it's entirely functional sapwood until the tree stops using that for conducting water. So it might stop conducting water to a branch because maybe a root is damaged. And so you can't draw the water up there. It might stop stop conducting uh, taking water up to uh, the sapwood in a branch because the canopy um, dies. It maybe it's shaded as a natural process from the canopy above, and this happens all the time. And so these branches will no longer conduct water, um, so air can get in there. Then fungi can establish, and they'll decay. And that's when you get natural pruning. It may be that an arborist, and we touched on this last week, comes along and prunes a tree and chops that canopy off. That stops the water being sucked in. And so that, um, that, that sapwood in that branch is then available to be colonised. And indeed, so is um, the, the tissue which, which fed it in, in the xylem. And then the other thing to remember also is that in big old trees, you do often have heartwood in branches as well. So in the large oak trees, you have the sapwood in the same way as it, the functional sapwood in, on the outside, just as you do in the trunks, and you have the heartwood in the middle. Um, when the trees retrench, when the canopy comes down and you get these stag heads sticking out, that's usually because, well, as, as soon as those parts of those branches are, are not having water conducted to them because the canopy is gone, the sapwood will rot for the reasons that I've already said, but the heartwood in this case often doesn't rot. And that's why you get these dead, dead black stag heads, if that helps a little bit more. Can I very quickly just chip in and say the hollowing of the horizontal, big, massive branches is a specialist habitat in its own right and can have um, unique species associated with that particular habitat. It's because the branch is facing the sun in a particular way and warms it and catches the sun, the light in a different way. And that makes it makes characteristics, niches that are, are, are almost unique. So horizontal open grown trees are really special. Mm -hmm. I think Caroline had a quick question first and then I think Neville did. Um, not a question. I wanted to address the question put in by uh, Sheridan Sayer. Uh, who asked what we think of the prospects of ancient trees, uh, given the rise in the use of tomograph, decay detection equipment, and the felling of trees for health and safety reasons. Um, I think 
these sessions have been about understanding about fungi in trees and those that cause decay. But we must really come away from this idea that all decay is the same in the consequences for the strength and the durability of the tree. And we also have to recognize that um, where there is decay, as has been said, this is very often limited in a whole number of ways. And therefore, what one should need to address in the case of safety, and I'm sure Neville may touch on this, is what is the strength of the tree or the part of the tree that is uh, that is still functioning to give the tree the safety that it needs. Um, and I said this last week, and you've seen from some of the uh, Lynn's slides this week, some uh, the tree on the first slide that we saw today had decay across a huge percentage of its cross section, and some of the other trees were hollow for very extensive areas, but they were felled by us. <laughs> So they'd been standing up until that time. We, were, we felled them. So this is what we have to establish. And it has to be clear that just because a tomograph finds decay, that doesn't actually mean that the safety of that tree is compromised. It just tells us that there's decay there. And then you have to go on then and assess um, what, what the safety factors are. And you have to remember that also um, that if trees have been pruned and load has been reduced and that kind of thing, all this affects uh, how you assess the safety factor of a tree. So um, tomographs, I hope, should not be, um, and I know this is one of the things that why we're having these seminars is to tell people decay doesn't equal danger or death. That's me. <laughs> Never. Thanks, Caroline. There was, a, there was a question in the chat there about that. And actually, I've had a, I've had a few um, emails this week from people who raise the same point. And I think it's, it's difficult sometimes because we obviously, the people here, view it predominantly from sort of, I guess, a, a UK perspective and what we've learned over the years and everything. And it's quite interesting hearing from colleagues uh, in other countries particularly. But um, uh, Alina here has said, do I understand it right? The signs of rot in a tree are definitely not a sign to fell it. Any idea how we can change that paradigm out there that trees need to be felled as soon as any signs of rotting occur? I probably had half a dozen emails from viewers last week asking about that. And the person I was going to ask is Mike, who's just disappeared, preempting the fact that I was going to ask him. But I think collectively, we all, you know, we all presumably agree with this. You know, do we want to get that message across? Decay doesn't mean you Mike, it. Mike, did you hear that? I want you to speak. Um, Neville's got something to say. Sorry, sorry Mike. Sorry, Neville. You're muted, Neville. Neville, you're muted. I can't hear you. I I'm sure Mike would say it better than I would, but I'm, I'm not sure why we worried about rot in any other way. Well, you know, um, we're only bothered about rot in terms of safety. You know, uh, actually, in terms of the tree, um, it's it's no big deal. It's part of its system. It's an ecosystem, and so, you know, uh, we're we're very hung up about um, uh, kind of using uh, equipment to discover what the problem is, how much rot there is, and so on. Actually, um, from the tree's point of view. It's just part of what it does uh, together with, you know, all the organisms. And so, you know, I, I was kind of intrigued. I think, you know, the work and the way you explain it, Lynn, is really beautiful in terms of the, um, how, how, how the complex communities of fungi are interacting with the tree. And that's obviously, it's obviously, you know, the more we know about these things, probably, you know, it's, there's, there's a lecture today on um, artificial intelligence and stuff. You know, things are just expanding exponentially. The more we know about these things, and the cheaper it, it is to discover, you know, what those organisms are, the more we'll find out that actually they're all kind of self-regulating. 
you know and when we get involved in it in some way uh, we become blind to the self-regulatory processes and that a, an ecosystem is you know what, what what's meant by a system is something that's self-regulatory it's got feedback loops it's got interactions between all these different kind of um, patterns of uh, uh, evolutionary organisms that kind of co-evolve with the tree and in a way you know we when we say what's you know that rot is a problem it's only a problem for us because the tree might drop something on our head it's just a you know it's a wasted conversation i think we should just completely put that out the window and be talking about what these processes are in terms of the ecology that we are part of you know we are part of we are just another organism in the ecosystem so my point in a way is that when jill's talking about sapwood you know essentially that's a, it's a or a young tree which at that point rot isn't happening very much mainly because you know young vessels are water saturated so essentially we're now talking about water and air and in a way the in the tree itself what's controlling that sort of thing is the porosity of the soil and how water is working in that system in a way that allows the tree to you know water plus carbon dioxide is sugar you know uh, and a, a system without mycorrhizal communities is kind of eight times less carbon rich than one that is in the soil that is you know and uh, so the system is far more if we could just get rid of the whole idea about we're dealing with rot because trees break up and decay and but then we could have a much more intelligent conversation about what this whole pro program is, you know, that is understanding uh, the, the, the tree, the fungi, the communities and so on. I mean, it's just immense, vast, you know. Uh, actually, you know, the, the uh, you know, credit to John, you've got, you know, large, probably part of the Earth's surface represented here, you know, um, the, the, the billions of miles of mycorrhizal filaments there that nobody's aware of, you know, they're, they're treading on, they're walking on, they're compressing, they're killing, they're, all the rest of it, you know, uh, and that's the kind of consciousness we need to shift in the discussion. Absolutely. There's a, a, one other question we've had during the week that I wanted to put to you, um, which kind of follows on from what Nev said. Is we often talk about how we kind of um, maybe educate the general public about the importance of all of these things or the politicians and everything, but also tree professionals as well. Um, we've had an email from a very dear friend of the association, Daniel, who's over in Israel. I know watching with some of uh, his friends and colleagues over there. Yeah. And Daniel, I hope you don't mind me reading out part of the email you sent me, but Daniel's been saying in Israel, we're still trying to stop the habits of wood dressings and paint on large wounds, digging into healthy tissue, drilling into water pockets, spraying mm. fungicides on rot or fruiting bodies when they appear, burning hollows and cavities as fungi sanitation, or trying to smoke them out, um, setting fire to them, then sealing it afterwards, filling the hollows. You know, this is, how, I guess, uh, maybe not a question there, but how do we kind of address this on a professional level and also send them a copy of british standard 3998 <laughs> <laughs> i've never said copies. <laughs> um could yeah, i just I answer anyway. there was a there was a You're there was a follow-on question in relation to something i said and could i just add when i was talking about decay and, and strength and remaining wood etc um, what you have to remember is, provided the tree is still growing and healthy, which is what we want, um, then it's continuously adding new, strong, unaffected wood. That would also apply to roots. Roots, there's a lot of turnover in roots particularly, but it is true, the question was, 
if there's decay in the center of the tree, is that not also going down into the roots? Yes, um, it may even have started there. But just because there is some decay in some part of the system, that does not make a tree dangerous. It, it, it has to be evaluated as a whole. Now, Neville has eloquently spoken about the fact that this is a, an ecosystem, but I recognize that um, if we live with these things, and unfortunately we cannot, we do not tolerate their natural failure, then if we're going to reduce their natural failure, which impacts us, then that will mean that we will we will continue to do some kind of evaluation of their safety. But what we certainly need to do is to understand that decay, the very presence of decay, certainly does not mean that a tree is unsafe. And even very extensive decay does not mean that a tree is unsafe. Um, and that we want to keep the trees growing so that they add more wood. And as I say, we uh, Lynn has shown pictures of extremely large trees with great areas of decay, um, but they haven't, they haven't fallen over, they're not unsafe, but over time they have most certainly reduced their canopy and their size of their, their crown so that the, the loads operating on the remaining parts of the tree are much, much reduced. And that's what we're looking at, loading on a system. What is that system? What, uh, how can that system continue to carry the loads and not break in a way that we find unacceptable? Um, I'd like to add a, add, a, add a point there, especially after hearing the guy in Israel. I think one of us has got to go. Uh, we, we can't let that carry on like that sort of thing. Um, but going back a bit, I, I because I came into arboriculture from a totally different angle from anybody else, and I started my life amongst some of their oldest trees, I, I couldn't understand from the beginning why lots of things were seen as defects, which to me probably meant that that is why the tree survived. And then, of course, going to the USA really opened my eyes because what I saw there was the ultimate perfect tree. To them, an ultimate perfect healthy tree. And that possibly is the wrong perception we should have. And I looked around the audience in the, in the USA and just said, well, how many of you are perfect? Why do you perceive that an, another organism, a natural organism, should be perfect? And then, so I finish up with this question to all those people that happen still to be on with us, is how do I get thousand-year-old oaks? How do I get that form? How do I get that shape when it's not interfered with by man? So what we perceive as defects and deficiencies and all the rest of it, possibly a part of what makes the old tree, apart from the fungi. So broken limbs, et cetera, et cetera, are so natural to a tree. And who are, look at the audience I'm looking at now. Not one of you are perfect. I'm sorry, Jill, but you're not, you know, so why? <laughs> You know what I mean? So, you know, don't let's stop looking for the perfect tree and think that tree wants to survive. All it wants to do throughout its life is produce seed. OK, so if it means losing most of its limbs and can still produce limb, produce seed, that's something. But if it's a perfect tree, a lollipop, which we made it, and it'll blow over, it'll blow over. So that's not what a tree was because it's no longer producing seed. You've got to look at it round the other way. Nobody answering. Maybe Go I can, Mike, maybe Mike, I can yeah. pick up from, Go on, Mike. Um, Mike. from one or two of the, the, the points that have been made. and particularly in terms of shedding branches, that, that's what trees do. They do it from a very early age. If you look at any tree um, of any size, it has probably lost as much material as you see in front of you, at least, to get to the stage that it has. 
Um, so that's all about growth and, and death and shedding of, of branches is part of that. And part of that process um, is, is dysfunction in the tissues that connect the branches to the roots. And that's where, that, that's where the heartwood, heartwood develops. And um, when, we, when we start to look at decay distribution in trees, we, we need to, in terms of safety and stab tree stability, we need to recognise that trees are structurally self-regulating. They grow according to the load and the way that that load is being distributed through the structure. Um, and as old trees internally decay away, they become, they die and, and gradually become degraded, then the tree externally, the new growth of the tree uh, compensates for any changes in, in, in structural um, integrity. And it's also important to recognise that, that trees grow to be stronger than they need to be to withstand prevailing loads. And as trees get older, um, they, they, they slow down in the, in the rates of shoot growth, so they're making less height, less radial spread, so less load but they continue to make secondary thickening, secondary thickening of the branches, the stems of the roots. And this gives additional strength and increases the safety factors of the trees over, over time. So some of the questions that you know, relate to decay um, seem to be based on the presumption that, that decay um, is bad. It's almost as though the decay is being viewed in isolation when really what we should be viewing is the decay as part of the overall growth process of the, of, of the tree. Well, I'm happy to jump in because I know it tends to run off in different directions, but okay, I thought that was going to get more response. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, there's a few questions we've had. I was going to throw a random one at you, Lynn, uh, which I liked that I've now lost, but it is from Ian. And Ian's asked, with their relatively rapid reproductive cycles, a fungi better positioned to cope with changes in environmental condition through genetic evolution? And does spore dispersal also make fungi better able to migrate? Um, yeah. So, okay, so, um, yes, the, the, the ability to reproduce sexually relatively rapidly does give fungi the opportunity to recombine um, characters from two parents and, and with all the spores they produce, some, uh, some, some of those may be better suited for better environments. So, so that is um, certainly true. But remember that... Uh, Fungi don't all uh, reproduce on a very short time frame. There's a whole spectrum of different abilities. So if you get these things like bread, bread molds, they will grow and reproduce within just a few days. Um, some of the things which you get when you chop a, 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 a trunk down, put it on the floor, fungus colonizes, there are, other, there are things there which will fruit within a few months because their strategy is to get in quick, grow quick and then fruit. But there are other things which won't fruit for very, very, very many years, probably things like fistulina hepatica um, uh, and the like. And I've forgotten the second part of the question, but it looks like Jill might be able to answer some of this. Well, Lynn, I remember a recent, you, you organised Friday fungi talks. And one very recently was about climate change and different types of fungi. Now, I'm trying to remember this now, but different type there was a statement from them that certain fungi are better are going to be better at responding to climate change than others and i can't quite remember the detail of it but um there were certain types of fungi and i, I don't think it was down strictly mycorrhizal or saprotrophic lines mm -hmm. can you recall that but uh, they're definitely going to be different responses to different circumstances. Well, certainly different fungi will respond in different ways because different fungi have different optima, maxima and minima for growth as far as temperature is concerned, as far as 
Yeah. Um, coping with low water content is concerned, whether they pr produce these survival spores. Um, so, so they have it's it's so, so it's so that is a good point, Jill. So it's it's not just this ability to mix your genes and come up with some some different phenotype um, in a relatively short time. Sometimes, sometimes, as I say, for fungi, it's a long time. Uh, but but diff different ones have different characteristics, and we will we, we we will find that probably we get getting differences in distributions of fungi in in space and time um, because they will have to, some of them will have to move. Um, as climate changes, we know that lots of the mycorrhizal fungi will have to move as climate changes, not because just because of the um, change in climate, but because their host plants, um, their host trees have moved. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so there's there's all sorts of different different aspects to consider. I think Caroline is very keen. Yeah. Sorry, it's just occurred to me. Remember, there's a number of questions about the public, and even if. If, if we educate ourselves as professionals involved in this business of looking at trees, making decisions about their future, et cetera, and their care, um, the Royal Horticultural Society is having a big push about fungi at the moment. Um, and obviously, I mean, sorry, in the UK, I can't answer for anywhere else, really. Um, I know Ted is uh, not keen on gardeners for a whole variety of reasons, but there is an organization which has the potential to reach the public and a lot of the public who are very keen on their trees and their uh, gardens and everything else. So maybe we should be trying to, um, I mean, I don't know whether there are any members from the Royal Horticultural Society's um, governing bodies or people here or people who run their sites listening in today, but if they're not, perhaps we should be promoting this webinar or some other webinars to them for extra messages that they could include. They're really doing the sort of wonder of fungi, which of course is part of what we've been hearing about, but they could take it on to the next level about why, why fungi are not to be feared necessarily uh, and, and regarded, as we've said, not as bad. I think that's a very good point, Caroline, because you're, you're, you're quite right. And so for example, at Wisley, um, they're fungi that are on trees. They are now trying to label them in the same way as you'd label plants in, in a garden, indicating what the role of that fungus is, what it's called, what its ecology is, what the role of it is. They also have their own plant pathologists, including tree pathologists. Um, so that is something we should pursue, I think. That's a very good point. I think actually plant life are doing something as well, which I thought was somewhat ironic. Um, and Ted would immediately jump onto it because, of course, as we know, fungi are not plants. <laughs> yeah. um, they are a whole kingdom in their they own are right. The first kingdom. Yes, they are the first kingdom. They evolved before plants, and probably plants would not have evolved uh, without them, and perhaps everything else as well. However, yes, I, I agree. But since pl since plants wouldn't be here with, without fungi, I think it's it's perf perfectly apposite that. Um, mm -hmm. That the uh, that, that anybody thinking about plants, any plant organisation should think about plants and fungi hand in hand. Admittedly, not thinking that fungi are plants, um, but yeah, good point. If I might jump in, there's a great question here about how much of the carbon in a tree ends up in the soil rather than in the air through decay and rotting, and I think that's a good question because. Um, there's a quick turnaround of decay of the leaves. And as I understand it, more carbon is given off to the air through the decay of the leaves on an annual cycle uh, than is uh, uh, maybe sequestered in some way. Um, but obviously there's a lot going into the soil through the root system. Um, I'm sure somebody else will be able to answer that really, really well, but Nev, you got any thoughts on this? Well, um, I think I think there's a lot of uh, confusion about um, the uh, essen essentially the, the systems that we're measuring. With I mean, Bifor, for example, is doing uh, at Birmingham uh, Forestry Institute, Institute of Forestry, is doing quite a lot of in interesting work on what happens if you pump carbon. Uh, 
a, a dark side around a tree and they're, they're doing work on whole trees. These are mature old trees, 150 plus year old oak trees. And they're, I think one of the papers has shown that you pump it in a, around the tree and the tree, the carbon nitrogen ratio is adjusted in the leaves. So the carbon nitri nitrogen ratio, if I remember, if I read it right, is more or less kept constant in the leaves. So the tree is adjusting the nitrogen it's bringing into the, into the leaves through the system from the soil. And uh, uh, Lynn will tell us that, you know, we've got a bit of a big problem with nitrification and its impact on the uh, effects of mycorrhizae. If mycorrhizae are fundamental to tree's health and um, continuity, then all the other processes are dependent on the, those feedbacks. And, and uh, so the thing is, when we measure what's going on in the, in the soil and what it's taking up in terms of carbon and, and what the, 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 all the different contexts of that in that soils are very, in, well, incredibly variable. And how, how we measure that is very important because whether that soil is effectively um, functional or uh, uh, got very little air, you know, pore space and so on, uh, or not functioning in the sense that the, the root systems aren't really operating uh, optimally, makes a big difference in terms of what you're measuring. And so if you're planting tens of thousands of trees and soil that you're trampling when you're planting it and you're moving all the pore space, uh, then in terms of what the trees can do in delivering carbon sequestration is quite different than if you're planting in a different way. And, and so these things, you know, aren't necessarily comparing like the like. I, I just want to say one thing. I, I actually only read today there's something called, just from our friends in Israel, um, that there's a, a new uh, initiative called uh, SPUN, S-P-U-N, uh, which is the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks. Um, it's been funded by a, uh, a, a kind of uh, an, another, another very rich person. And, and essentially what there's a realization or that that the kind of billions of miles, as we were talking about, of, of, of fungal filaments in the soil, which are serving uh, the, the whole of the kind of life system of the planet is uh, endangered. And, and, and one of the areas, I think there's 10 or 12 areas that have been sampled um, uh, is in Israel, in the Negev desert. So, you know, our friend there might be interested in that. You're right. You're right, Jill. That is a that is a very interesting question, and, and lots of uh, it has been quantified for various um, plants. I, I just don't ha have the information immediately in my head, so the information is there. Um, one one interesting thing, which which sort of vaguely relates to what we've been saying, with elevated CO two in the atmosphere, so more there's more carbon dioxide for trees and other plants to take up. And they do this and they, and they can in increase their, their net primary productivity. Uh, but also they, they change wh where they're allocating their carbon or what chemicals they're allocating to. So it seems that um, some trees and other plants are, are able to make more, if you like, inhibitory compounds in their leaves. Um, things that would inhibit, I don't know, grazers or what have you. And when these fall, their decay rate is different. So some of these things are changing because of climate change. But I'm afraid I, I don't have the, the facts and figures and the information to that at my fingertips, but it is a good question. Obviously something for the next edition of the book, I think. Um, there is an interesting paper, um, joint authorship in the next RFS journal, um, which points out the real true demise of mycorrhizal fungi 
and they don't obviously they're just talking about mycorrhizal fungi but they're not really looking at um what happens when we lose so many of our mycorrhizal fungi through aerial pollution and nitrification and what have you how are the trees going to survive and for a long time now I think with the audience we I'm looking at now is that we've looked at mycorrhizal fungi as not only being the providers of most of the food, but also they're the first line of protection. And in doing so, if this first line of protection of the trees from, uh, dare I say it, pathogens, then we could be into serious times um, for trees. Uh, and I think it's it's one that should hopefully somebody will pick up on and start to look at look at the why are the I mean it's very easy to say that the mycorrhizal fungi are in decline primarily because nitrification and what have you, uh, but I think it's also what what are we going to do? What what are we going to do? What's what's going to be the, the is it going to the demise of trees going to follow? Yeah, inter interestingly, um, some mycorrhizal fungi are doing rather better, but they've got rather different ecologies than those which are which are declining. So the, the mycorrhizal fungi, which seem to be coping well with um, increased nitrogen, are those which have what are called short range foraging strategies or don't produce much mycelium, which actually goes out and forages. They're very, they're very close. Uh, close to those root tips. It's those ones which are the long range searches for water and nutrients uh, that are changing. So it's even more complicated than just they're being lost. Some, some are relatively increasing. Yeah, but does it go right? Like we need to know what the consequences are for, for yeah. the trees. Does it mean that the short range ones have to produce fruit bodies to colonize new trees? I, I, I don't know. Because at the moment, there are very few fruit bodies being produced anyway. So, so there could still be a disadvantage there, obviously. Right. Has, uh, has anyone, we, we said we finish about half seven, and it's half seven now. We've gone a little bit more, but has anyone seen any other questions asking the panelists here any other questions that have caught your eye that you'd like to draw a bit of attention to i saw one thing that i wanted to, to harp back to um was that very early on in the chat it was i was just asking about the xylem really as to whether if a root's damaged i think on one side and hence water doesn't go up or if the canopy is damaged on one side does it just go straight up that side of the tree and you, you know where that that water's going and the answer to that really is not necessarily at all because xylem actually very often spirals around the tree you could see that on um the strip canker uh with utopus spinosa where the the, the the canker spiraled around the tree and that's because it's following the spiral round of the xylem that's just one point Caroline's got a point. Just, a, just another quick point. Um, as well as sending copies of British Standard 3998 to Israel, um, we should also be promoting publication by the National Tree Safety Group, which is which is there. There's a number of people talking about that the buck stops with them. And I fully understand that as consultants or contractors, you're being asked for your professional view on these things. But it's a question of we don't nothing. You're not being asked for hundred percent safety. This is not achievable in any uh, sphere of life, and the National Tree Safety Guide is there to give you confidence to make judgments about these things, which are supported by um, a uh, an influential document produced by a whole group of people, which essentially says you're not being asked to. Um, produce a situation of 100% safety, you have to balance risk versus benefit. Um, and it's, I think, if Neville wants to say anything, because he's actually associated with it, but it's on the web, and maybe John will put up a link to the present guide, 
and it comes in a number of formats for different people, including the public or tree owners. So we talked about tree owners earlier. Um, so, you know, it's in a sim uh, straightforward short format for tree owners as well as professionals. Um, uh, thanks, Caroline, for bringing that up. Um, yeah, National Tree Safety, it has three levels. One is a kind of like a hard, hard big, substantial guidance document with several chapters, including scenarios. And um, there are five basic principles. Um, and um, those three kind of levels are the householder, the landowner, and the kind of organization, if you like. Um, and it's currently, it's about 10 years old now, and it's being revised. It's the revision process is very, very lengthy, I have to say. Uh, some of you have been involved in it, and um, Mike knows quite a lot about it as well. And also, um, it's finally getting its feet under the table in, in the, in the, um, in the law courts, and again, thanks to Mike, um, it, you know, the, but the main thing is that big organisations like the National Trust and some others, well, others like the City of London and, and so on, are, uh, uh, and, and um, the Royal Parks nationally use it as a basis for what is reasonable and balanced risk management, public safety management. Um, and the the basic principles behind it are, so on the one hand, I'm saying, well, trees don't need us. They just get on with their business. But, you know, we put them under stress. We, we stand under them. And then essentially we create problems for ourselves. Well, also, and for the trees and, uh, and then insurance companies are involved and, uh, and law cases happen. And, but very few people die as a consequence of trees falling on our heads. Yeah. Very, very, yeah. very few. You know, and and the, the, the statistics actually seem the the more they're looked at, the smaller the amount of people. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that any particular. Tr so essentially, it's that knowledge that the risk from trees is technically extremely low compared to other risks in life, and extremely low. Um, that doesn't mean a particular tree poses an extremely risk, low risk. And obviously the more people around it and near it, the, uh, the more, more rot it's got or whatever it is, um, the more it's looked at, if you like, and the more we may invest in it. Um, uh, so there's a, there's a, essentially we have over the last 10 years, and thanks to a lot of people's good work, uh, built a kind of rational basis for thinking about managing the risk from trees. Uh, we've got it, it's sector wide. It's not just one small group of people working on something because they're obsessed by it or whatever. You know, all the major uh, arboricultural, forestry, land based organizations are stakeholders in this in the UK. And uh, the current revision. Is going through a really hot, uh, had a, came from a two hour meeting today, and it's a long process, that's all I can say, of doing the revision because everyone's got something to say it, whether they're involved in law, they're involved in risk management, or they're involved in land ownership or whatever. Um, uh, but slowly we will produce the uh, second edition revised uh, uh, in 2022. <laughs> Um, uh, so yeah, by, please go onto the website, National Tree Safety Group, have a look at it and download the documents. Just another thought, if I can, just remember that very important places for ancient and veteran trees with very great amounts of decay and very old trees are found in places like Burnham Beaches, the Royal Parks, uh, Epping, um, uh, help me here, Jill. A uh, lot of National Trust places and millions of people go to these places and they don't think twice about the fact that they're close to these trees. They enjoy these trees. They enjoy all the things that are associated with them. So, you, you know, people need to kind of think, why should I uh, be so concerned about my tree with a certain amount of rot in it? 
because actually I'm quite happy to go and walk amongst trees with an awful lot more rot in them. And um, these are managed very carefully and with consideration, as Neville has said, for the balance and, and the reasonable approach to safety. So, you know, we, we've really got to see that um, these are examples of things where trees with much more decay than trees that are being felled for smelly small amounts of decay still exist and exist in, um, in uh, proximity to hundreds of people probably more than hundreds, uh, thousands, millions of people, if you counted up in a year. Um, can I just say that I saw a question, uh, is it Naomi, I think it is, uh, is that right? No, someone else, uh, anyway, it was, it was, um, it, it, it was, it was concerning the, our insurance companies involved in the NTSG, sorry, it's Ian Hannah, and, uh, in, so many, so many organisations are involved in, in the National Tree Safety Group. Um, insurance companies were invited to be involved. Their response was that the risk from trees is so low, it's not worth their effort. Uh, yeah. Anybody, mean, like, sorry. anybody like a bit of news, just to change the way we're talking? Uh, at the beginning of the oak processionary moth arriving in the UK, uh, I took a stance was, let it be, let it happen, and let's, because throughout uh, history, certainly since the 1950s and the arrival of things like DDT, man has yet to control any invasive species. They happen, and yet we pollute our countryside and all the rest of it and their marshes and whatever because of malaria and we go on. Man has got this patronising attitude that he can control nature. So when it was on its way towards Windsor, this is the old processionary moth, I pointed out that Windsor had a collection of very ancient trees, biological continuity, and that there was a possibility that when it arrived at the UK, at Britain, at Windsor, there would be organisms there which might jump on this oak processionary moth and start to, if you like, influence it and control it. But in actual fact, organisms did start to jump on on the um, oak processionary moth a long time before it got to windsor but they still persist in spray and insecticide and we've got to get across to people that it's very very difficult to control nature roll with nature go with nature the the if you like Kalara is a great example and the spraying of the insecticides for oak processing moth, all they did was was delay it and call and kill the very beasties that were going to control it in the first place. So I think more and more, especially from the agricultural people, is let nature rule. Let's 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 watch nature. And this is how the ancient tree forum started. We, I, the audience I'm looking at, we all stood around looking at an old tree seeing what was happening to it and and no disrespect to the to the people i'm looking at but we all learn from something from what nature does to trees didn't we must we did <laughs> absolutely yeah well unless there's anything burning anyone else has to say i think learning from nature is a, a good way to um to possibly finish that. If I'd only it was that easy, we didn't need to organise a whole webinar. We could just have gone outside, really. But there we go. It's cold and dark and windy, so it was worth it. Um, right. We're going to send all the questions and all of the chat to our wonderful panel. And like I said, we're going to have a good chat about it. Uh, and we're going to find out some of those main topics that kept cropping up. And we're going to have another webinar. So hopefully you will all... Uh, come back and watch another round of this sort of thing probably at the beginning of next year because we've got a couple already booked in up until Christmas so I think that sounds like a great plan um, thank you so much to all of our panel and to uh, Lynn of course for your presentation and thank you to our wonderful audience you're all lovely and hopefully we'll get to see you next week uh, look after yourselves get thinking about all the stuff that you'd like to see more of and let us know and we will put something together for you so stay safe Thank you to the panel, and we'll see you soon. Yeah. Good night, everyone.
Have a safe new year. 